The views expressed by the host of this podcast are not opinion-based or for entertainment purposes. They are actually facts and truth, no matter if other people like it or not. It is the Michigan sports truth, and nothing can ever stop it from being correct. Hey there, Michigan sports fanatics, and welcome to episode 222 of the Michigan Sports Truth on Spreaker, the show that is honest and reveals the facts instead of just being lazy. I'm Taylor Phillips, live from my basement apartment office in the northern outskirts of McBain, Michigan, and you can follow me on Twitter at DT2Phillips with two L's. With me on Facebook Messenger audio from the state of Georgia, as always, is my co-host Ed Smith. You can follow him on Twitter at EdSmith313 and and add him on Facebook as Edward Lawrence Smith, but he goes by Ed Smith. Thanks so much for being on here with me, Ed. How have you been? I'm doing quite well. had a bit of a long day of work, but uh, uh, I'm going to get on my way this time to hear the show. And, uh, you know, I'm in a little bit of a happy mood seeing how good of a job the Tigers are doing, so I think that'll be a good place to start, don't you think? Yeah, let's do that. That one is long gone! Lots to discuss on this podcast episode here, but... uh, we're going to start off with the Tigers. They've won seven straight now. They completed the sweep uh, last week at Fenway Park with a 4-3 win over the Red Sox in Boston. It, it, uh, Michael Fulmer was pitching uh, to start off with. Uh, he he actually uh, couldn't hold on to the lead while he stayed on the mound. He was pitching uh, pretty good, but but he couldn't hold the lead in the uh, seventh and eighth inning. It was 3-2 to two after seven and 3-3 three, three after eight. Fulmer couldn't finish the eighth inning. Brad Osmus put in Bruce Rondon to finish it, and Brad and uh, Bruce Rondon finished it without allowing a run, and, and so it was tied at three after after eight. And then Miguel Cabrera hit a game-winning solo home run in the top of the ninth, and friend and Justin Wilson got his first save of the season. Then the Tigers had Thursday off. Then then they absolutely annihilated the Houston Astros, fourteen to six, three to two, and eleven to nothing. Uh, to complete that three-game sweep. Fridays and Sundays uh, game, games were routes, but uh, Saturday's game, Justin Verlander pitched the entire game, all nine innings, blew the one nothing lead, fell behind 2-1, to one, and still picked up the, the win, and uh, that, that, that blew my mind. What were your thoughts on that, Ed? Uh, yeah, that was a sandwich in between a couple of laughing after routes against Houston, um, but the game on Saturday night, which Verlander pitched, was uh, somewhat say a microcosm a little bit of what the season has been through, but also, in my view, a microcosm of how Justin Verlander, first and foremost, has made a complete and total turnaround. Um, I think it's safe that we can use the B word now, Taylor. He's back. Justin Verlander is back. Um, that was as close to a vintage Verlander performance as you ever saw. Um, he, this was his first complete game of the, of the season. Um, he was just on it. His all his pitches from his fastball to his curveball, even to his changeup, uh, he was getting guys out, getting swings and misses. Um, Eleven strikeouts in that start for Verlander, all while giving up a mere two runs and five hits. Any other night, you would think, "Holy crap!" Oh, <laughs> that, man. That, was, uh, that was almost a guaranteed win. But on this night, it almost didn't look that way because that, those two runs that Verlander gave up came up in the ninth. Uh, it wasn't so much that he broke down all oh, while wow, he threw bad pitches. Uh, you got to give credit to Houston here. Uh, some of the hits that they got in that ninth inning to get those base runners on, eventually scored those, run, score those runs, were pure, I guess you could say, luck of the draw hits. They managed to get the end of the bat just on that ball or got through this, this stretch, uh, uh, this defensive shift, or this, you know, just out of the reach of this one outfielder. Just, just that's how you would describe their hits. Fluky. I guess you can. I guess you could use if you could use a Twitter trend. It'll be those Devils Twins hits. Uh, how the Minnesota Twins always seem to get t- weird, tricky wins back in the day. Uh, hits back in the day to get wins over the Tigers. I guess you could say that Houston got their own share of Twins hits in that ninth inning. Um, and while everything was down, you know, it it it, it went. Uh, it looked down for sure because you would think, oh wow, it, it, we would hate to see Justin put you know, after a display like that go out with a loss. But luckily. Uh, his teammates backed him up and I guess you could say bailed him out, but came through for him more importantly, uh, in that ninth inning. Um, I'm trying to see, I'm trying to remember if you want a second. I think something was, it was a leadoff batter, I believe. Uh, one moment. I'm sorry. All right. Yeah. Okay. Here's what happened. Right. I remember Will Harris, he got the first two guys out, uh, but the rally all started when he walked Justin Upton, just Upton, by the way, who has had quite a remarkable turnaround. Uh, since the All-Star break, Jeff Moss noted on Twitter, who you can follow, by the way, folks, at Jeff Moss, Jeff Moss DSR on Twitter, yeah. he noted that since the All-Star break, Justin Upton's had an OPS of near around uh, .900. 
um, quite a turnaround than what he looked like in the beginning of the season, uh, beginning of the year. Um, and he had another effect too by joining that that two out walk on Saturday, which allowed to get things going. Uh, a crazy single by Tyler Collins. By the way, Will Harris, his breaking ball um, was it, it failed him when he needed it the most. Uh, uh, Tyler Collins, that he was able to get a single off that, and then of course Brian McCann, who's had a bit of a whirlwind of, uh, of his own, uh, managed to get. Uh, I guess you could say ran into one. He didn't necessarily hit a home run, but he, it felt like a home run when he hit it. Uh, another bloop single, once again off of a hanging Will Harris break, breaking ball. Um, that was allow uh, that allowed, uh, uh, I believe that allowed uh, Upton to score. Um, so that tied up the game, and then all of a sudden, Jose Iglesias, who you always know with his speed and his quickness, even if he hits a uh, uh, slaps a, slaps one slaps a grounder to the third base, it's never a sure thing because with his speed, he can easily beat out that throw. And so when he when he comes up. Uh, once again, on two strikes, it should be noted, uh, Harris did just, you know, once again, um, he was the closer for Houston, but when he got to two strikes, could not get it done. The Tigers were literally down to their last strike a couple of times, and in this instance, Iglesias was down to two strikes as well, before eventually, in a ground ball, which was between first and second, uh, even though the first baseman, uh, Jason Castro, Looks like he got a good field on it, but when he threw at the first base, uh, Iglesias, with his speed, was able to beat out Harris, uh, the pitcher, to the bag, and that in turn allowed uh, Collins to score, and of course the Tigers got the win. So um, I guess you could say, to describe that ninth inning, a uh, bit of unfortunate uh, luck of the draw for Verlander, but again in the ninth inning, patient hitting as well as timely hitting, um, as well as a little bit of luck on their side, helped the Tigers uh, get the victory in that one against Houston for sure. Well, I'm the best you've got. By the way, what we want to remind everyone that the Michigan Sports Truth podcast here on Spreaker is in search of local advertising sponsors. If anyone has a business that's interested in sponsoring this program, please email me at taylorgatorphillips14 at yahoo.com or privately message me on Facebook or Twitter. Again, my Twitter handle is dt2phillips with two L's. But um, Justin Verlander, uh, just despite giving up that those two those two go ahead runs, uh, st- still uh, fi- finished uh, the complete game. And in order to, uh, to be uh, to still be eligible for a possible win, and the Tigers g- got them the win. The offense uh, came alive in the bottom of the ninth, and and they uh, and they won it walk off style. Yeah, and it was in, in essence, it was it capped off a terrific month of July for Justin Verlander. Um, uh, granted, he, he lost only two starts, uh, but even still, like uh, with, with his with his uh, starts in all of his starts in July, he gave up only allowed only either two earned or two earned runs or below, no more than two runs. Uh, throughout that whole month of July. And one of those starts was against a hot hitting team like the Boston Red Sox only gave up to go, gave up an earned run in that one. So that was one key to him having uh, a terrific July, whether it be having location on his fastball or velocity, regaining velocity on his fastball, flat out striking guys out the way he used to in 2011 and 2012 was when he was that Cy Young slash MVP winner and that uh, absolute all-around caliber, I guess you could say one of the top 10 best players in all of baseball. Uh, he showcased that from those previous years in 2011 and 2012 in this game in and of its own. So like I said, uh, microcosm for Verlander, but also microcosm for the, top, for the team falling behind and yet, you know, finding some way to get back in it and rally back, was able to come from behind and get the win. So I guess you could say that, as it turns out, it describes what they're doing right now um, in these current uh, standings not just trying to chase the walk-off spot, but, you know, don't look now. Uh, they're within earshot of catching Cleveland in the Central Division. Yeah, because they uh, beat the Chicago White Sox 11-5. 11, 11 the day after, they stood pat at the trade deadline, which was Monday afternoon at 4 p.m. They were uh, looking at starting pitcher Jeremy Hellickson of the Philadelphia Phillies and uh, Jake Odorizzi. Uh, also, uh, Rich Hill was... Uh, Available, the Athletics were uh, willing to trade him, but um, but uh, the Tigers uh, didn't do a damn thing. At least they didn't sell. Yeah, 
yeah, that, that's, I guess you could say that's a silver lining to that. Yeah, they didn't sell, but part of you wish that things, listen, you see how much of a, uh, of a windbag in the sense that the White Sox have become. You see Cleveland starting to fall apart a little bit. Maybe they're coming back down to earth. This is probably your chance, and not to mention, you know, KC, oh my God, what's happened to them? This is your chance now, if you're Detroit, to capitalize on it, pounce on it, as, as you would, pardon the animal pun, uh, and take advantage, take control, regain uh, this lead and possibly hang on to it for the end of the month, because guess what? It's just August, and once, you know, September is right around the corner, so you want to get as many of these wins as, as, you must, as much as you can possibly can here, and you would have thought that maybe Detroit, knowing the weaknesses that they have, this is not some perfect team by any means. Uh, they had a few holes that they got to fix here. Now, some of that is due to injury, but still, uh, you think maybe since they're not in a bad, nowhere near a bad spot as they were last year, where they absolutely had to sell, you think maybe they would be, be a bit more inclined to buy this year, uh, whether it be, more importantly, on the pitching side of things. I don't think they need to get another bat per se. If it was maybe for a catcher, I've heard of Luke Roy. Uh, uh, of course, he went to Texas. He went to the Rangers. Um, so that was out of the option. So other than that, you really didn't need to upgrade at bat because what, uh, JD Martinez is coming back soon from injury. Uh, in fact, uh, Tigers, uh, posted a tweet saying that, uh, he will be reactivated from the DL list tomorrow, I believe. Is, or, or is, is he going to be placed on the DL list or is he being reactivated from the DL list? He, he is reactivated from the DL tomorrow. There you go. JD's back. So I think that's, I guess you could say that's their unofficial, uh, trade deadline acquisition. Uh, I thought maybe they would focus more on the pitching side of things, knowing A, they have a huge, glaring, gaping hole in their starting rotation with Anibal Sanchez, and B, uh, some of their set of guys to get to the back end of their bullpen are not quite that, uh, you know, uh, I guess you could say, uh, that finished product, per se. So I think maybe they were trying to aim more towards that. I think due to the fact that, I guess, you know, some teams were probably asking for a little bit too much that the Tigers were willing to give up, uh, i.e., oh, we want Michael Former or former or Daniel Norris, that sort of thing. Maybe the Tigers are too hesitant on that regard. Uh, if that's the reason, hey, it sucks, but that's how business works out sometimes when you're trying to conduct a trade in any sport. Uh, trade-offs, you know, it's it's all in the name, all that. You gotta, it's, I guess you could say in the, in the words of, uh, of, a, of an anime that I used to watch, it's an equivalent exchange. So, you know, if the Tigers didn't feel up to it, okay, you know, Granted, yeah, thank goodness you didn't sell, but I don't feel your chances. I think if you would have if you would have bought, bought more in this time around, not only does it give you a good chance to to win this division, but hey, keeps you out of that wild card spot. And once you win your division and you just you know uh, you're in that safe spot per se, what to do when you get to the playoffs? Uh, looking at look at what your starting rotation may be: Jordan Zimmerman, Justin Verlander, Michael Former. If he keeps this up in a short series, plus maybe a Daniel Norris. By your starting pitching alone, you would think, uh, especially if Norris is healthy at 100%, um, you have a good shot as anybody. And then we we'll factor in Miguel Cabrera, Victor Martinez, J.D. Martinez, Kinsler is still setting the table the way he's doing at, at, at the top of the lineup, uh, even though uh, J.D. is hurt right now. But look, Cameron Maven's filling in. Just a, excuse me, Justin Upton's coming back to form. This is actually a team you wouldn't quite, wouldn't, uh, quite would not want to sleep on in the postseason, except the fact that their manager is an imbecile. That's one big X factor there. Even still, the Tigers are as, could be as talented a team as, as any if they had their own shot in the postseason this year. But I think they would have been in a better shot to put themselves in that position if they were more inclined to go out and buy in instead of sell out everything last year. Yeah, and speaking of Brad Osmus's imbecility, uh, he, he started Andrew Romine at third base. And Romine... Had a slugging percentage of under 200. Like I, I know you don't want to tie out Castellanos every day, but illogical, or even Maven for that matter. But still, there, th- that's another example of what of how Romine's bat stinks. It's just not good enough. Not nearly good enough, in fact. But um, but uh, that that was in tonight's game. That was in two. That was in Tuesday night's game. 11-5 win. But um, one other note uh, on that. Anibal Sanchez threw six innings of work, and only and he only allowed one run. The other the other time that uh, Anibal Sanchez made a start, uh, like two weeks ago or something like that, he he allowed three runs. One of them on the mound. The other two charged to him while Bruce Rondon was uh, getting the help beat out of him. So uh, I think we may see uh, 
a bit of an improvement by Anibal Sanchez. Uh, maybe, but you're never quite so sure. This is his first. This is the first time since April 28th that they only gave up uh, one run um, in, a, in six innings of work. That's a span of 11 starts. Okay. Um, yeah, he gave. You know, at least he didn't give up a home run, but uh, he didn't look quite as good early on because you know he was giving himself in the jams early on, and you're, you're thinking, "Oh crap, here we go again." Um, it's a good thing he was actually facing a team who is, you know, as Jeff Moss noted. Uh, in the White Sox is, I think they're about the third offensively worst team in all the American League, and they're hitting in one of not the best hitters ballparks in the American League, if not all baseball. Um, so that was going to help out Sanchez's chances a little bit. But even still, um, knowing the fact that a your bullpen was clearly well rested, well well rested after the nine innings of work Verlander put in on Saturday, plus the day off on Monday. So what was your excuse, like? You know, this is second half of the season. Crucial games you got to win. Keep yourself in line for the playoff spot. And you're trotting out a guy who, who, without question, has been seen as an automatic loss uh, for for past couple weeks now. Um, you're, it's what you call treading with dangerous waters here. But thank goodness you're playing a horrible team, or, or rather a team that's very performing very badly right now in the White Sox. Okay, if you did this against. Uh, Against Baltimore, Toronto, holy crap! You begin smacked around the park right now. Um, so they got that working out to their advantage uh, by just. I think you know, I, like I said, it's 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 well documented how much we do not trust Brad Ausmus to make a conscious or a uh, coherent or flat out easy decision, a simple decision um, in a way that could be least detrimental to the whole entire team here. So uh, to see him pull this type again, type of stun again, I'm, I'm a little bit numb to it, unfortunately. But uh, you know, you hope it doesn't come back to, to hurt the Tigers in a real bad, crucial spot in the game or whatever. You have the sinking feeling that maybe you know it's probably going to happen uh, one of these games, but you just don't know when. But you know, you, you can't focus on that right now. You have to focus on the fact that this is the team now. Uh, they've won eight out of their last ten. They've now won seven straight in a row. Um, they're now three games back of, of Cleveland for uh, uh, the, the lead in the American League Central Division. They'll probably remain more than likely remaining remain a one and a half games uh, back of Boston for that second wild card spot. Even though you know Seattle's trying to do a bit of get a rally going right now in the bottom of the eighth, they're only trailing four two, two men on, one out. But hey, so if, if Seattle can help us out here, come back get a rally on Boston. Uh, put the Tigers at a uh, half game back of that second wild card spot. And that definitely looms big considering how Detroit swept that series against Boston last week. So, you know, yeah, you want to try to do what you can't get back in the division race, but also knowing the fact that, hey, you got these other teams that have slim leads ahead of you in this wild card spot. It doesn't necessarily uh, hurt to hedge your bets here and hope that uh, certain teams get knocked off ahead of you to give you a chance to have, a, I guess you could say, a backup plan B to your plan A. The Red Sox are, are making a pitching change still in the bottom of the eighth with one out and two men on, trying to hold on to their 4-2 lead. They lead the Tigers by, by a game for the second wild card spot in the American League's wild card standings. But, but yeah, I, I definitely agree. We're in, the, we're in the beginning of August now. It is now August 3rd, and the, the Tigers uh, just have to keep picking it up. They need to they need to uh, win it, win as many games as possible. They need a little. They need to win. They need to win a lot of games. Most of them are at home, and they need to take advantage of that. Even again, even against the toughest teams, and he, and especially against the the not so tough teams. Yeah, I mean, granted, like you know, yeah, you you have a a, a tough three game stretch coming up against uh, Baltimore. Well, hold on a second. I'm looking at September's. <laughs> Excuse me, one second. Uh, you finish out this home after this uh, series with, with Chicago. You finish out the home stand with the three game set against New York. Probably want to take at least you know at least two, if not three, of these final four of the home stand before you head out on a six game road trip, starting with three in Seattle and ending with three in Texas. Then you come right back home, uh, start another seven game home stand uh, on Monday the fifteenth against Kansas City, and then a, then a four game set against Boston. It's a good range of what the Tigers can do, um, not just in front of Comerica, but away from Comerica, too. Um, at least, you know, one good thing from going for tomorrow, they got Michael Fulmer again. 
Uh, unfortunate thing is he's going against Chris Sale. But uh, the Tigers have found a way to get around Sale in some meetings past. So um, if they stay patient, uh, try not to overthink themselves with, with their at-bat, uh, they probably find a way to get a few timely hits, uh, make this a winnable game. Maybe for, maybe they just need uh, to pick up uh, what happened in one of Fulmer's previous starts uh, where he didn't have wasn't quite on his game, but the offense bailed him out, so you never know. But uh, with Fulmer on the mound, it gives you a better chance uh, of possibly uh, grabbing another W uh, and, and officially claiming this series, even though uh, you're going up against Chris Sale as the opposing pitcher. Fernando Abad is the new pitcher for the Red Sox, taking on Robinson Cano. No balls, two strikes the count right now as uh, the Red Sox and Mariners uh, return return to action. But um, speaking of returns to the uh, the active list, Jordan Zimmerman is set to start on Thursday at one ten in the series finale against the Chicago White Sox after his rehab assignment. So uh, we're gonna we're getting another starting pitcher back. Yep. One down, one more to go after that while we wait on uh, Daniel Norris to, to finish up his rehab starts. So like I said, the Tigers, I, get, I could see the reasoning, some of the reasoning behind them staying pat because like I said, oh, we're getting J.D. back. Oh, look, we're getting Zimmerman back. Oh, look, we're getting Daniel Norris back. They would see that, I guess, as their unofficial uh, trade deadline acquisitions, um, getting key guys back from injury. Uh, but don't also be too, too surprised if they try something uh, during the waiver period. Remember, that's how uh, Dave Dabrowski is Nebraska was able to get uh, Delman Young uh, back in 2010, even after the trade deadline had passed. Uh, and w- with his badge, you saw how, how uh, I'm excuse me, not 2010, 2011, um, and you saw how, how Young's bat uh, was able to contribute in key spots for the Tigers in the postseason, even to the point where he was named the 2012 ALCS MVP when the Tigers sweep the Yankees en route, en route to getting swept by the uh, Giants in the, in the World Series. And this just in, Robinson Cano just hit a three-run home run to right center field, and the Mariners take a 5-4 lead in the bottom of the eighth. All right. Well, once you know, Robbie Cano, thanks a lot. Oh, man. That's a bonus. I love it. That was off Fernando Abad, the former Minnesota Twins relief pitcher. So with all the Tigers stuff out of the way, pretty much almost, the Red Sox and Mariners are still going on right now. It may, it may just go to the end up in the top of the ninth. Jeff Moss just tweeted, holy S, Boston up 4 nothing in the bottom of the eighth. David Price pitching a gem. Robinson Cano just went deep to make it 5-4. Insane. Mariners, and, Mariners, Mariners I, I may add. So Nelson Cruz will try to extend the Mariners lead, the designated hitter tonight. And Abad will, Abad will stay on the mound for the Red Sox. That's got, that's got to be absolutely a crushing blow to Boston, seeing how they were trying to hold on to this game, and then boom. I know. Now Moss tweets, I love baseball for the time being, in parentheses. Yeah, for the time being, because one of these days, the stress from watching games like this is going give, to give all of us heart attacks. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Yep. Now there are two out because Nelson Cruz flied out to center. But uh, there are other stuff we need to... Uh, we need to uh, discuss besides the Tigers while while this contest is going on and De Holy at bat the first baseman. Little uh, little quick update on uh, the Spart the uh, Michigan State Spartans football side here. Touchdown MSU. Jordan Z- uh, Michigan State Spartans football former punter Mike Sadler. After his passing, he was inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame class of 2016, and there's a reason why. I guess that's an early quick headline. Now, now we can uh, discuss Red Wings here. Should be more uh, than one, I have to, well, I have to acknowledge a uh, very class, uh, classy gesture uh, by the MSU Athletics Program for that, for sure. Um, a great way to, to uh, uh, pay homage uh, to the young man who lost his life. Very respectful. Yep, I, I absolutely agree. <laughs> Now some Red Wings talk. There was an article from from Greg Wyszynski of PuckDaddy.com from uh, Yahoo Sports. He wrote an article that that uh, he had that headlined, "Did the Red Wings overpay Danny DeKaiser?" See, uh, he he was uh, 
He was uh, signed by uh, General Manager Ken Holland to a six-year, $30 million contract, a long-term contract. Just just another one of those long co- a long-term contracts that we discussed last year. Uh, the but, good old-fashioned Kenny Holland loyalty, loyalty bundle. Yep. My God. But there was an article that popped up late last week, and, and it gives us analysis that um, the Kaiser is going to get a four point five to five million dollar average annual value, but but by year, this this upcoming season he's going to earn three million, and then the four seasons after that he's gonna um, he's gonna earn five million dollars each, and then um, and then and then the year after that he's gonna earn like four point five million. But uh, the details are there on 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 that article. Basically, and, what it and, breaks down what it breaks down to is you know this season base salary would be three mil. For the next three, the base salary would be five mil, um, and then for the last two years of the deal, four and a half million would be the base salary. The signing bonus is this year mil, uh, one million in the next three seasons, five five hundred thousand each. Uh, no signing bonus in the fourth deal, and then the signing bonus in the fifth deal, another uh, half mil. Yeah, and and uh, Greg Rzinski uh, also wrote six years for f- an average annual value of five million per year is uh, a bit too much. and um, especially, that, it's, especially if it's for a player who I consider to be, a, I guess it would be fair to call a gross underachiever in, in the Kaiser. Yeah, and uh, that, that that kind of answers that question. It gives us, uh, it, it gives us uh, a hint to, to our answer, which, which is uh, pro- possibly going to be yes. The Wings uh, might, might overpay Danny DeKaiser in the future. And, and um, that's that's just uh, Ken Holland right there. What you say? You wish you know he had. It's something you wish you had a feeling it was going to happen, but you still wish it hadn't happened. But like I said, it's Ken Holland. You know how much loyalty how much loyalty he has, even to a fault uh, that he has to some of these players around here. So as long as he is around, he's around. That's not going to change. That's right. It, it's probably not going to change for for an even longer time. Even even if Ken Holland were were to be fired after next se- after uh, the season after this up, upcoming season or the year after next year, in other words. So uh, moving on, we're going to discuss the Pistons a little bit. Left side line free and he answers. CBSSports.com ranks the uh, ranks all thirty NBA teams in starting lineups, and the Pistons are in the top ten somewhere. And I'm. I'm going to list. I'm going to read the entire list right now. Number one, the uh, number one ranked starting lineup in the NBA, the Golden State Warriors, obviously. Mm-hmm. Number two, the Cleveland Cavaliers. Number three, the Los Angeles Clippers. Number four, the San Antonio Spurs. Number five, the Utah Jazz. Number six, the Toronto Raptors. Number seven, the Boston Celtics. Number eight, the Memphis Grizzlies. Number nine, the Detroit Pistons. And number 10, the Atlanta Hawks. Number 11, the Portland Trailblazers. Number 12, the Minnesota Timberwolves. Number 13, the Dallas Mavericks. Number 14, the New York Knicks. Number 15, the Chicago Bulls. Number 16, the Houston Rockets. Number 17, the Washington Wizards. Number 18, the Oklahoma City Thunder. Number 19, the Indiana Pacers. Number 20, the Charlotte Hornets. Number 21, the Miami Heat. Number 22, the Denver Nuggets. Number 23, the Milwaukee Bucks. Number 24, the New Orleans Pelicans. Number 25, the Orlando Magic. Number 26, the Phoenix Suns. Number 27, the Sacramento Kings. Number 28, the Los Angeles Lakers. Number 20. 29, the Brooklyn Nets, and number 30, the Philadelphia 76ers. So that's uh, kind of an understatement, isn't it? But uh, we, I think we have an update on the Red Sox-Mariners game, don't we, Ed? Um, I think I can update everyone. Apparently it's gone final in Seattle. The the, Seah- uh, the Mariners beat the Red Sox 5-4. Uh, that 3-1 home run from Robinson Cano proved to be the difference. So now the Tigers are officially a half game back behind Boston in the, for the second spot in the American League wild card uh, chase. Um, but going back to what I was saying before about the Pistons lineup, the CBS Sports article not only have Detroit listed as the ninth best lineup in the league, but they're fourth best in the East. That's behind Cleveland, Toronto, and Boston. That's ahead of teams like Atlanta and Chicago and New York. Uh, 
I'm guessing that's probably seeing. I guess uh, some of those writers were very impressed by what the Pistons have done this off season. Uh, the acquisitions they made in, tra- in the draft and the off season with free agency, um, respective, respectively, uh, respectively, excuse me, I should say, um, got them quite impressed. Saying, "Hey, you know, Stan Van Gundy, Jeff Bauer, they seem to be doing a good job here. Got a young starting co- lineup that's going to grow more and gel better." Um, and seeing how they, how even though they got swept by the eventual NBA champions, look how competitive they looked in those four games. You then you're starting to think, hey, maybe they you know, find a way to take that next step, get a few more wins, get a, get higher up, then gain a few more seeds. Uh, who knows? They could probably one of one of those teams, four teams in the East, to make it to the second round of the playoffs. So I think those are your expectations that at least uh, this in the CBS Sports article that are being laid down upon for the Pistons to see what they can go to try. Uh, God and achieve uh, for this upcoming season. Definitely, yep. And then uh, we we also heard that um, the Lions are predicted by USA Today to go seven and nine again this season. We yep. should say that answer for five questions. Yep. Mm-hmm. Also, uh, uh, they also. Yep. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. Quick headlines. A lot. Just a couple of them. Lions wise. They signed cornerback Darius Slay to a four-year, $50.2 million contract extension with $23 million guaranteed per profootballtalk.com. Also on on 24-7 sports, they waived wide receiver Ryan Spadola and signed wideout Damian Copeland. And speaking of five questions, it is that time. There you go. So why don't you say we just let him rip, Taylor? It's time for five questions on the Michigan Sports Truth on Spreaker. Question number one, do you think the Tigers should have traded for another starting pitcher and two relief pitchers? Uh, at least uh, at, at least one of, of the other two. Um, if they would have gotten both, yay, you know, whatever. Uh, everything was, I guess you could say, uh, icing on the cake per se. Uh, but I would have been fine if they had gotten t- taken care of at least one of those things. Probably more so lean towards the bullpen uh, than the starting pitcher, because like I said, it begins with a short playoff series, and you're dealing with Verlander, Verlander, Zimmerman, and Michael Fulmer, maybe even a Daniel Norris if he's okay. Uh, I'll take my chances with that starting line, starting rotation, and let me just find, find a way to tinker out my bullpen to get me look as strong as possible for a short series. So at the very least, I think they could have tried to do whatever they could, could have done to improve uh, their middle-end relievers. Um, Pitching period, but if they would have found a, a reliever of sorts uh, to help them get to that back end, that would have been fine by me. Uh, but if I would, if if you give gave me the option of hey, this is one reality, hey, they stand pat, but another reality, um, and they went on a fire sale again. Which one would you choose? I would rather choose the stay pat option. Unfortunate as it may sound. Next question. Question number two is Anibal Sanchez starting to improve after two decent starts. No, I wouldn't necessarily say that. I want to see him see if he can keep this up. Um, not just the next start, but the next two or three starts. You know, I want to see if is he going to go back to get four or five more runs uh, the next start. Is he going to walk walk too many guys? Is he going to just put his team out of reach early on? Where even if the you know you score a three or four runs uh, four runs scored in a, in a half of an inning. You know, you're just in too much of a deficit because of how much of a bad job your starting pitcher did. Um, so I guess you could say I'm more so, even though I'm usually an optimistic guy, I'm, I'm leaning on the waiting for the other shoe, the, the drop side of the fence here. So I'm not having the most, the best confidence that Sanchez can go back out there um, and do the best he can without giving up at least two, maybe three runs maximum. But if he gives up, you know, like I said, gets shellacked for another four to six uh, next time out, then no. So I'm not being, I w- I'm not having the most, the best confidence in Sanchez right now at the moment, and that's a shame. Next question. Question number three: Did the Red Wings in fact overpay defenseman Danny DeKaiser? Uh, to keep it short, yes. Especially like you said, when you go back to the previous episode that we had, uh, where we discussed a series of tweets that Bashant Iyer uh, had, which detailed, you know. You know what they're what the Red Wings are paying for. It's not exactly uh, on the surface. They're not getting back good investment, to say the least. So by that margin alone, alone knowing how uh, good on his march Bashan Thayer is, 
uh, in terms of ana- analyzing some of these players with the metrics and, and, and sort and different all kinds of sort. Um, I have to say then, yes, the, ty- the Red Wings definitely did overpay uh, for the Kaiser for a multitude of reasons. But once again, when Ken Holland's involved, it's not that surprising nowadays, to say the least. By the way, you can follow uh, Prashant Iyer on Twitter at Iyer underscore Prashant. Next question. Question number four. Do you, do you agree with the Pistons being ranked ninth in the NBA starting lineups category by CBSSports.com? See, that can be interpreted different ways. If I say I agree, then I think I'm at, I might be overrating them to a certain extent. But if I say I don't agree, then I don't want to be seen as, oh, wow, what do you got to play what, bottom 10? No. Uh, they're no worse than a top 15 team. Uh, I think, you know, uh, if they play up to their best potential, I think uh, you could see them hovering around uh, this potential outside of the, of the top 10 bubble, you know, on that fringe or on that edge. Um Obviously, I'm a little bit happy that they have it at ninth. Probably a little bit. I'm probably able to place them a little bit lower. Probably say around 12 or maybe even 13th. Because, like I said, I think to put them over teams like Atlanta or even New York or Chicago to an extent. Well, maybe New, maybe Chicago, I get, but place them over uh, Atlanta. I don't see that. Um, and even though, yeah, Derrick Rose is not what he used to be. I, I still like, you know, on paper, a lineup of him, Joe Kim Noah. Rashad Porzingis and Carmel Anthony looks like a, a good enough squad that can get you a high number of wins in an in Eastern Conference that's not as tough as the Western Conference. So, see, this Pistons lineup being placed over those caliber teams like the Atlanta Hawks or the New York Knicks caught me off guard a little bit. So that would be probably the slight portion of it of uh, this article that I would disagree on. So one probably to answer your question, no, I wouldn't rank them ninth, but I'd still keep them around uh, that area. I think I have. I have to agree. Next question. And finally, question number five. What do you think the Lions' record will be in 2016? I've, I've had this number in my mind for quite a few months now. Probably it was cemented when Calvin Johnson announced his retirement. But, yeah, you made some nice, adjustment, nice adjustments. It's made some good signings. You know, even the Anquan Bolden thing, that caught me off guard. But based on a multitude of things, primarily the fact that I do not trust his coaching staff whatsoever, and I hate <laughs> that not only the coaches app is still involved, but also, you know, the ownership is still involved. So knowing how that's poisoning and <laughs> tainting my feelings on this subject matter, um, I would readily admit, it, by the way, I see this as being no better than an eight win, maybe a nine win team if you catch somebody off on, on a bad day. Uh, but I don't see them getting 10 wins this year. And obviously, I don't see them going to the playoffs. Um, with Jim Caldwell as a head coach, like I want to see him succeed, but it's like what I'm seeing with Brad Ausmus, they will be succeeding in spite uh, of their net head guy. So I see that I see my official position would be eight and eight. I uh, kind of would like to see nine and seven, but I'm thinking more than likely to be eight and eight at best. All right. Well, uh, I would say six and ten to be honest with you. Yeah, I was going to even say seven nine as a backup, but yeah. Like I said, on uh, my best hopeful, hopeful, optimistic approach is eight wins. So six wins is not that far off. All right. Well, uh, that's our five questions segment for all the listeners out there and fans out there as well. If you want to answer those questions, just replay the episode and answer them in the comment bank below this episode. That wraps up episode 222 of the Michigan Sports Truth on Spreaker. Thanks so Thanks so much again for your help. I'll talk to you again on episode 223, possibly Sunday at 11. Before I sign off, I want to remind everyone that the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast here on Spreaker is in search of local advertising sponsors. If anyone has a business that's interested in sponsoring this program, please email me at taylorgatorphillips14 at yahoo.com or privately message me on Facebook or Twitter. And I'll, t- and I'll talk to you uh Sunday at 11. Take care. See you then, Taylor. And for Ed Smith, I'm Taylor Phillips. If there's anything you fans want more of or less of on our podcast, please let us know. Follow us on Twitter at DT2Phillips and EdSmith313. TTFN, ta-ta for now. Bon appétit.